My name is uh, David Lawson. Uh, I am the uh, lead of the ag, food and uh, consumer team, as well as the export supply chain services uh, here at Austrade. I'd like to welcome you all to the second of our ongoing series of industry briefings around uh, export supply chain services. I'll be hosting uh, the session for you today. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of land on which I am present uh, and my colleagues here in the room with me and present, of course, uh, we are on the lands of the uh, Gadigal people of the Eora Nation in uh, downtown Sydney. And uh, we pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and we also extend our respects to uh, any uh, Indigenous uh, or Torres Strait Islander people present on this call today. Uh, so uh, we're thrilled to have um, a, a significant turn up for this uh, session today. Uh, and it really heartens us that there is strong interest in the work that we're doing. And just to summarise the main functions of what we are doing, uh, we've been tasked by the government to, uh, to coordinate uh, our intelligence collecting uh, and insight sharing uh, to connect with various partners, including state uh, and territory governments, industry associations, uh, and of course, most importantly, connecting uh, with exporters through uh, through industry associations, but also uh, directly through the Austrade Global Engagement Managers uh, and the Extended Trade Start Advisor Network. Um, we've been uh, gathering significant intelligence from uh, from all of the elements of the uh, of the supply chain, uh, airlines, shipping lines, ports, airports and associations, uh, as well as uh, various uh, freight uh, and logistics associations. And uh, hopefully you're all receiving the fortnightly snapshots uh, and uh, we are thrilled that, uh, that you've been able to join this, our second uh, um, summit. Um, so uh, the objective today uh, is to uh, is to uh, hear uh, from industry. Uh, in in the first instance, we'll be hearing from Michael Byrne, uh, who is the principal for the Export Supply Chain Services. Uh, he'll be briefing us on the latest uh, observations from what we have gleaned uh, in relation to air and sea supply chains, uh, and what we can expect uh, as we go into the peak summer season. Afterwards, we're really excited that uh, we've been joined today uh, by one of the panel members, uh, sorry, one of the board members of the, uh, of the governance body that is looking after the export supply chain services, Dr. Hermani Parsons, uh, as well as being the, uh, a board member for the export supply chain services. She is the CEO of the Australian Logistics Council uh, and Hermani will provide us with an update uh, on the state of supply chains from the industry perspective. We're really uh, keen to engage with you though, and uh, there's a great opportunity for, uh, for question and answer at the end. And I just draw your attention to, uh, to the Slido function. If you don't have the app, you can uh, log on uh, to the website, slido.com. Uh, we are using the hashtag ES CS, uh, and you can follow along real time uh, with any questions that are being asked as we uh, as we go through the proceedings, uh, and in the end we'll uh, oh, and also you can vote on those as well if you find a a particular uh, uh, question that you find of interest as well. Let us know, and that way we can prioritise asking and answering and, and having that question uh, answered. You can uh, remain anonymous through that system or if you want to put your name in and let us know uh, what your personal thoughts are that's uh, that's terrific as well uh, so here's the timeline you don't need to hear from me and without any further ado i'd like to uh, pass to uh, michael byrne so, so, <coughs> so thanks david good afternoon everyone i hope we're all well um and still afternoon in wa so we'll start with air freight um in the main since about july we've seen uh air traffic international air traffic only go up by about 1% each week. So it went up in the main by 
it went down by 1%, went up by 1%, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. Although when the new Northern Hemisphere <coughs> schedule came out on the 31st of October, um, it did go up about 10% in one week. Then this week, the latest numbers for uh, last week that come out this morning are it went up by 1%. So we're at about 70% of pre-COVID number. So we're at 2,300 flights pre-COVID. Um, it, it fluctuates between 60 and 70%. It's not 60% on all lanes. There are real differences. <coughs> um, we're also seeing a lot of the planes that are coming in as that, that big increase of 10% R2 Bali, Fiji and New Zealand. So they don't really change our view on what is happening with freight. Freight prices are stuck in the main apart from spot at around three times, uh, maybe slightly less, but not much. They went up from two times when IFAM finished to about three unless you're in Western Australia. Um, Sydney Airport is still dominant at 43%, up from its pre-COVID number of 38% but down from its peak of over 60%, with Melbourne uh, being much stronger than it was historically during COVID. What we're seeing, though, the reason why prices aren't coming down, there's about four factors going into that. One is utilisation of planes on passengers is much higher historically. We speak to every airline. They were typically willing to fly another plane at about 75%, uh, utilisation. At the moment, particularly the Americans and uh, the Middle Eastern airlines are way above 90%, 95, 96, 97%. And that is crowding out, obviously, freight. Uh, why is that happening? Two, they have to, one, they have to repair their balance sheets. Two, they have to make money. I had someone say the other day um, that Qantas made $1.4 billion, yep, yeah, but they lost $7 billion over the, uh, the prior periods through COVID. So they have to repair their balance sheets, they have to make money, they have to pay down their debt, they have to look at re-gearing. Yes, a lot of the airlines got handouts around the world, we know that, but they still have to repair their balance sheets. So it's going to take two or three years for them to do that um, if they can keep travel up. Um, <coughs> to Fuel so expensive, <coughs> we're seeing real shortages globally of fuel and energy stocks. <coughs> you would have seen that OPEC uh, cut production by a theoretical number of 2 million barrels a day based on Russia and Venezuela. It's really 1 million, dollars, 1 million barrels a day, not two, because one was a theoretical number versus a real production number. That is, those prices are driving old planes out, old engine technology. We know some airlines have got a whole lot of 777s parked. No, they're not flying because the engines in them are far too old. And then 25 to 27% of their costs, they're not going to fly them. Uh, we also speak to the airlines. They have Some of them have large, uh, large reductions or shortage of the technical crew. One airline we spoke to, Global Airline was down 4,500 technical crew. It'll take them a couple of years to rebuild that. So they don't want to fly planes that are very old um, because of fuel. They don't have the tech crew and they want to repair their balance sheets so they're not putting on lots of planes. Um, we're, we're hopeful that we'll remain at about 70% of pre-COVID. We know that there won't be much room for freight in January because... Chinese New Year is smack bang in the middle of school holidays. And from what we can see on forward, looking apart from North America, particularly Canada and the US there, and also Japan for the Northern Hemisphere skiing season, there isn't a lot of extra planes coming on board. Now that may change, um, but it's not looking like there's a lot of extra planes coming on board. They want to keep airlines want to keep their utilisations numbers very very high. Um, we are thinking that more planes will return to the market in the second quarter of 2023 for the northern summer flight schedule, which seems to be a, being aligned with a large influx of technical crew. Um, 
praters, what we call praters, they're going the way of the dodo. The usage is fading away. No one's bringing praters back into the online because passengers drive money. So praters, what we saw as freighters, uh, which were passenger planes, usage was only 1% in August, down from 18% in Europe uh, for, the, for the month, the same month a year ago. So it was 18% of all air traffic in Europe was praters. It's now 1% uh, because those planes are either being turned out or going back to uh, passengers only. We're not. Ex we're speaking to the airlines. Basically, none of them have said that they are going to change their freight profiles. It's a nice way of putting it. Uh, because they know there's more elasticity in it. It doesn't need to go there. They need to make money. They can't go back to where they were. And they're not going to put a whole lot of planes on. And if you look at production for A350s and 787s, they're only rolling out at seven, eight, nine a month to replace all the old uh, planes that have old engine technology burning fuel hard. It is going to take a fair few years to get that number. So I think we are where we are now, at least until um, March or April. There'll be some slight change, but we're not seeing or expecting very much. Sea freight, sea freight, as we know, you would know, has <coughs> changed dramatically over the last month. Um, and that's a really interesting thing, what's happened there. Uh, re if you look at, the first number we look at is what is at anchor and month on month that improved by 50%. So we were at about 13 days at anchor, uh, the global fleet, and in one month it went back to seven. Um, first time since April global schedule reliability decreased, but we got down as low as 25%. Uh, we were at 75 to 80% reliability and on schedule prior to COVID, that got to 25%. We're back at around 47%, 45.5%. Um, so that is one of the highest numbers, the second highest number, the month before was higher. Um, while there's, there's 7.3 million uh, equivalent ships, container, TU, tonnage on order, that's about equal to 28.3% of the total fleet. It's likely that a lot of that fleet will be replacing old fleet. On average, shipping companies want to keep their fleet at around 25 years. We know there's a lot of ships being kept at 32. The first of the 32-year-old ships has now been beached in Bangladesh and is waiting to be cut up. Why? Inefficiency, fuel burn, too heavy with bunkered fuel. And if you look at the bunkered fuel price, I think we've put it in there remains elevated at $811.5 a metric tonne. Um, this is more than double what it was in November 2020. So that the shipping companies need to get rid of these old ships. Um, it's their largest operating cost. And if we think that they're going to keep running those ships at those prices, and there's a lot of work being done that Northern Hemisphere winter fuel price Ukraine, Russia war and low inventory levels uh, will continue to put push pricing up in the Northern Hemisphere with a shortage of feedstock and that prices will go back up even though they have collapsed as we know over the, the latest period. I think that also the new compact as we know comes into place on the 1st of January so more ships have to be turned out or steaming, die, steaming has to be slowed between 10 and 20 percent. All those things in there, age of profile of the ships, steaming time and fuel price probably means that um, prices have gone down material around the world. If you look at the Shanghai index, etc., they had a peak of 18,000, 20,000 US dollars up from 1,300. I think like, like, yes, last week we're at 2,400. So they have come down dramatically, but they are still 80%, 85% above 
pre-COVID, if you recall, when we did a big piece of work at IFAM, we thought, and that was through um, Boston Consulting, I think it was, they said that long-term shipping prices may fall and only be 30 to 75% above pre-COVID. Uh, so we're at about 85% on uh, the Shanghai index. Unfortunately, prices X Australia, while they have come down, haven't come down at the same rate as the in, uh, Shanghai index. Like that's down 90%. We haven't seen prices move like that. Um, China's COVID policy is still affecting shipping operations. And I noticed there was lockdowns again overnight for another 5 billion people. Uh, Shipping lines, we've been having a lot of chats with them, particularly one of them who have said that they will now prosecute a strategy much harder on the ongoing basis uh, to standardise their modulisation of their business and get away from 20-foot containers. Um, only about a, the last test from the Department of Ag, only about half of food-grade containers coming into Australia meet the standards for export. Again, that is driving up uh, pricing. So shipping export rates have not gone down at the same rate. Is that making Australian competitors uh, uncompetitive relative to declines in shipping rates for exporters from our main people we compete on agriculture? Yes. Um, do I think that that will change? No. We're one point seven percent of global to u trade so we have no leverage here um, i don't think that those prices will uh, decline at the same rates as around the world nor do i think that shipping companies will allow them to decline because they'll probably uh, marginally costed on exports anyway and they believe that there's more elasticity in the pricing of our exports i think that a lot of our exports you'll find even because of ukraine and russia our prices of commodities in the main have gone up. Some of our some of our commodities, particularly non-mineral, even though minerals have been very good as well, have gone up. So the um, the shippers are smart enough to work that out that the, they can get a bigger spread or percentage of that elasticity. Um, I think the other thing that I, I would note about shipping was there was some good news in. Uh, the UK overnight, it probably hasn't been published yet. Uh, we know that a month or two ago, the Germans finally uh, came to an agreement with all their maritime unions there at about 9% um, to get all those men and women back to work. Last night in the UK, uh, Pill Ports and other, union, other uh, ports with Unite came to an agreement uh, to stop industrial action, which has been going on now rolling one week on, one week off, one week on, one week off, two weeks on, two weeks off uh, for a couple of months. <clears throat> and those uh, union issues were resolved last night and there'll be no more industrial action in the majority of ports. Um, it would seem in the UK starting from the first shift, starting in about an hour probably. Um, so industrial action has stopped, which is good for uh, Europe and good for global trade. The only therefore one outstanding is the US West Coast, which uh, the unions are probably working out their strategy after the midterms last week. Uh, and what that may mean, there's 24,000 people who have knocked back a 24% industrial offer, 14% in the first year and 10% in the second. So it was good news about that. The, ba the bad news about that is if you've got the Germans who have settled at 9% and uh, the Pommies who have settled at 11, where their inflation or RPL is 12.3, <coughs> and then you've got the Americans who are knocked back 24 over 2, it's unlikely, I'd su suggest next year, that the MUA and the TWU and everyone else are going to settle at 2s and 3s. Uh, if, if inflation here is 8, and even next year the federal government says it'll be above 5, there's no way they're going to settle at twos and threes when that you have that level of inflation. You may have another 100 basis points or 125 basis points of interest rates and you've got industrial instruments settling in those um, sectors at tens. They're not going to accept twos and threes here. So I think we need to think about uh, for next year 
how uh, inputs in transportation and in our water side and land side will flow through to how we, people manage their businesses next year and also allow that to flow through into their cost base and how they manage their business. So but the, in the main, much better outcomes in sea freight. Um, although if you look through some of the things on numbers, particularly on fuel, and then the change to steaming from the 1st of January to comply with emission targets, I don't think uh, it's all over yet. And on that note, David, staying mm. right on time, I will stop. You've, uh, you've done well keeping to the time, and uh, boy, it's always sobering listening to, uh, to your observations, but we thank you for your deep insights there, Michael. And without any further ado, and it gives me much pleasure to uh, invite uh, Dr Hermione Parsons to, uh, to give an industry perspective on the state of supply chains. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, Michael, um, and great to be here speaking with everyone. Um, I thought the way that I would talk about the state of supply chains, next slide please, Max, um, would be to focus on the, uh, some of the things that we can do in terms of moving forward. Um, we know about the turmoil and the volatility of supply chains globally and in Australia. Um, most supply chains could possibly recover from one, maybe two, maybe three of the current events and tensions, but uh, all occurring at the same time is overwhelming supply chains everywhere. Uh, in Australia, the Australian companies uh, are basically losing $11 billion a year in forfeited sales. And one thing we do know about is the enormity of the global challenges facing us and facing the world. Uh, and as a, as a small island nation, a long way away from the rest of the trading routes, what can we do? Um, and so how do we move forward? And I thought I'd focus on three points. Uh, developing supply chain resilience and what that looks like. Uh, ensuring the suitability and connectivity of our national infrastructure. And, a, and building a sustainable skilled workforce, skilled workforce. I think my key point here is, following on from what Michael was saying, that there are loads of things we can't control but what we can control is what happens within our own country. And we need to start working very hard on improving the sustainability of our supply chain industry within Australia. Next slide, Max, thanks. So what is supply chain resilience? If you think about it um, as uh, a memory foam pillow, the first definition of resilience is if you squeeze down on that pillow and then you release the pressure of the pillow, the pillar will bounce back to its former shape. So that's the first definition of resilience. We can't bounce back to that former shape, nor necessarily do we want to, given the situation with fuel, fuel security, fuel costs, energy, decarbonisation, etc. So we can't just bounce back to what we were before. And the second definition of resilience is to recover quickly. And clearly that is not happening, and that is very unlikely to happen. So tuning a supply chain for resilience is a balancing act. Before COVID, the emphasis was on lean, but highly effective and rigid supply chains. Um, and now we're moving towards highly agile, but prohibitively expensive supply chains. So the point of balance will be different across industries. As we move from just in time to just in case, we're talking about very expensive inventory costs. So an optimized resilient supply chain is an end-to-end -end network and an end-to-end -end system. The more resilient the supply chain, it seems, the more complex. Next slide. So globally, 70% of companies are still grappling with the information gathering and an evaluation of the pandemic effects. And as we know, we're still in the pandemic era. There are five ways of developing a sustainable and resilient supply chain. And those five things are listed there. One is supply chain mapping, all processes, all relationships, all geography for every aspect of the chain. And clearly that's an exhaustive process, um, but a very necessary process uh, when you're looking at innovation and change. Procurement strategies and looking at the way in which you can reshore, maybe move away from reliance on China, but that's not really diversification. That's just a simple, well, that's a, a big one-step change, but it's not diversification. 
an example of the procurement strategies is a healthcare organisation doing absolutely everything right in terms of the procurement of all goods, all, all componentry towards the manufacturing of goods. But the one problem was the, uh, they found was that they weren't able to access the ink that was required to put the label on the goods for the expiry date, and therefore the whole process came to a grinding halt. In terms of inventory planning, buffers are expensive, um, and then we'll look at harmonisation and data sharing, and of course many companies are reluctant in terms of data sharing, particularly in Australia where um, there is a reluctance there. Um, an example of resilient supply chain, I thought I'd quickly put in one of years ago, and still happens with Australian vegetable growers, some of the best Australian vegetable growers had a very peculiar strategy, which was all about resilience, obviously. And that was uh, a major grower would be supplying not just one supermarket, but say two supermarkets, um, maybe three, would deliberately be splitting the load so that it would go to each of the wholesale markets of Australia, rather than focusing on one customer and one big supermarket and one big um, market. And the reason was to have a strategy that was prudent, and protecting them against the resilience of all sorts of changes within the supply chain. Next slide. The second point, so the first is the resilience issue. The second is ensuring the suitability and the connectivity of our national infrastructure. Um, studies estimate congestion costs will increase. We've already doubled since 2016. The Australia, Australia's urban freight task is set to grow by 60% by 2040, and infrastructure investment is not keeping pace. So to what extent are we planning for our supply chain future? There is a chronic undersupply of industrial land, and this is now a very serious issue for Australia in terms of our supply chains going forward. If you don't have the land in the right place, then you incur extra costs with every move in transport. We've also got increased rental costs of prime grade warehousing, 13% just since June 2022. New buildings, say in Western Sydney, increases of $30 per square metre for an average size warehouse. E-commerce alone in Victoria requires an additional 490,000 square metres for 2023 to 2025. So land in the right place is an absolute critical issue for our supply chain future. Next slide, please, Max. And to give you some latest stats on industrial land use, Australia has the lowest national vacancy rate for industrial use land in the world. Sydney um, had 0.4% six months ago. Now it's down to 0.3%. Melbourne has gone down from 1.3% to 1.1% in the last six months. Brisbane um, has gone from 2.3%, the best off of the capital cities, to 1.4% over a six month period. So the industrial land is being chewed up by urban encroachment and by other uses. But the global average you'll see is 2.7%, Europe is 2.6%, US is 3.1% as of March 2022. Australia has the lowest national vacancy rate. Now this causes very significant problems. And in Melbourne, for example, the empty container parks, because of policy decisions about 30 years ago, were pushed out to the western suburbs, away from the major port. What that causes is huge congestion issues, um, it contributes to congestion, but it creates a whole problem with extra transport legs and extra transport being required for all bulk deliveries of containers to and from the port. So we need the land in the right place. And with a decreasing amount of land available, we have a problem. We can't claw back that land. So this is a very significant issue for us going forward now and in the future. Much of Australia's freight planning focuses on individual modes, say a railway track, a freight depot, a port, um, and it doesn't focus on the system of supply chain or freight logistics, where we look at end-to-end -end supply chain, where one end in an export chain is in another country. Um, we have, I, in my view, we have our freight planning is very confused by urban planning as it exists in Australia, where nothing in the postgraduate or undergraduate courses 
across the 26 universities that teach urban planning, not one has a unit that is based on supply chain, freight, logistics, productivity, efficiency, or anything to do with the economic fabric underpinning our society. But urban planners are taught to look for amenity, that is the enjoyment of space. They are taught about, say, active transport, bicycle riding and walking. So the emphasis in the urban planner's mind, because of their training, could well be how to make sure that people enjoy walking through the city rather than maintaining loading bays or protecting the, the use of freight vehicles to be able to access the businesses that they are protecting and caring for. We also, of course, have politics getting in the way of our freight planning and our infrastructure. And the long, long history of the inland rail pr probably shows that most clearly. And then government preferences, say, saying that uh, passenger is so much more important than passenger, than passenger freight. A passenger transport, say, passenger rail, is far more important than, say, uh, freight rail. Um, and so what we have is a situation in Australia where back home in our own country, given the enormity of what's happening, we need to really shake the cage and make sure that we review our industrial land use and our freight planning uh, so that we do have a strong future. So we have these issues with um, amenity, freight corridors, and a lack of joined up thinking. Joined up thinking is critical in terms of making sure our supply chains can work and be competitive in global markets in our future. Next slide, please. Okay, the third point is the skills crisis. And it's a big word crisis, but I think we actually have it. We've been watching it very carefully for a number of years, for probably about 12 years in my, in my experience. And it's got worse and worse <coughs> and worse. Um, demand for supply chain talent is outstripping supply. There are almost a half a million unfilled jobs in Australia. Transport and logistics across Australia is reported to have up to 20% reduction in available staff. Um, the workforce is ageing and we have a very strong uh, problem with gender distribution with accessing only um, mainly the male population. We're now in a competition for supply chain skill labour with the rest of the world. It used to be that poaching was the main way of um, uh, recruiting talent in Australia. One company to the next company to the next company. But what we're finding now is that our skilled supply chain labour is being contacted by companies across the world seeking them out to come and move to their own uh, different countries. So this is a very significant change in the pressure on our supply, chains, uh, on our supply chain workforce. Companies are under enormous pressure um, some new um, you know, truck uh, drivers, one out, of, one out of five trucks is uh, reported to be uh, sitting idle. In the top end and in remote areas, uh, it's, anecdotally it sounds like basically companies are almost giving up because they just cannot get the drivers. Major, major retailers have sort of pallets as the indicator sometimes of um, uh, number, uh, the limited number of workers. Um, there are some examples where a major retailer has pretty much the store shelves are nowhere near as full as they should be. The DC is filled with pallets, filled with product, um, filled with freight. The breezeway is filled. The container is still unloaded because there are not the staff to unpack the, the load. So these skills short, the skills crisis is a very serious issue. Next slide, please. In this pack you in this I put this graph up I thought it would be interesting building the skills of Australians for supply chain is not just vocational education it's not just truck driving although those two are very very important it's also graduate and postgraduate education it's apprentices and trainees it's diversity and inclusion this graph I deliberately showed wanted to share it with you in 2002 you'll see a great fall in the graph and then you'll see another one at about 2012 the one in 2002 was when government funding for logistics education ended in VET. So you can see it was building up to having a fairly strong uh, presence and then government funding was cut because uh, the priority listing for immigration shifted away from logistics being there, but more importantly identified exercise science, forensic science and beauty as much more important to our economy to bring in the international students. So. What this, the reason for explaining this is we need to be thinking about supply chain workforce 
It's a capability requirement for our country going forward, and we need to be working on it quickly. Next slide, please. And so the final point here is about immigration reform. Many years ago, uh, and I think it was under Gough Whitman or under Bob Hawke, that sort of era, there was a big question about the population of Australia and our immigration. At the moment, our, our um, birth rate and our death rates mean that we do not have anywhere near the uh, people to call on for a sustained skilled workforce. And so immigration reform seems to be a really critical issue and putting logistics on the priority migration skilled occupation list. We have all sorts of issues in terms of residency and visas, but I believe this is something that we now need to be thinking about for sustainable supply chains. Thank you, David. Terrific. And how incongruous uh, in this wide brown land that we have so little land available. Um, it is a great concern. Fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. Um, I. Uh, Thank you very much for that, but uh, we're, we're going to go into questions. Before we do, I just remind everybody that slido.com, or if you've downloaded the app, um, you can uh, ask some questions there. There was uh, a question there which was asked, but answered already by the administrators. The question was, uh, will, this, will the slides be available? And the answer is yes. So uh, uh, there are two ways to get access to that. One, because you've registered, we will send you a link. Uh, later on, we'll also, and I draw your attention to the fact this session is being recorded, uh, so we'll send you a link through to the uh, uh, through to this presentation. But uh, uh, we'll also make the slides available. Um, and uh, if you are maybe listening in on somebody else's uh, uh, iPad in a crowded room, for example, and you would also like. Uh, a copy. I'd like to draw your attention to our um, our website, which is um, supplychains at austrade.gov.au, uh, and uh, and we can email that to you. Um, and uh, so we've got one question um, uh, which has come up on Slido, which I will now ask, and um, uh, it's from. Ms. or Mr. Anonymous, but they come from Queensland, and I can tell you the reason for that. Um, great to be involved in the session. Terrific. Um, we know that there's a major issue with regards to the last mile rail infrastructure in Brisbane, and I'm, 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 I'm looking here at, at, at Michael and Hermione. There are too many trucks on the road into the port of Brisbane because we don't have the right rail infrastructure into the port of Brisbane. And I'm just reading uh, this person's commentary here. Uh, so there are too many... Um, too many trucks don't have the right rail infrastructure into the port of Brisbane to carry the export commodities. Any comments from the panel on how this might be fixed? <laughs> well, so two, two things. So just for completeness, as always, or otherwise I'll get on trouble. Well, I'll remind everyone that I am on the uh, New South Wales ports, MSW ports, which is Port Botany and Port Kembla. And then I do do a lot of work for the federal government at different times for in the National Intermodal Corporation. Um, right, if you look at overall TU or import export uh, or even Ag 2030, uh, which is a fantastic piece of work done by in a bipartisan way by both sides of government on how they want to move from 70. 68 billion, 72 billion to 100 billion by 2030. There is no way on back of fag packet mathematics that you can get those tons across our ports without a huge change in rail for all the ports. And building a couple of 600 metre um, or 500 metre or 400 metre rail sidings for a port doesn't, doesn't change the math. So I believe the federal government are again having a look at the inland rail and it's being reviewed again. And I remind everyone the first time that was put to the States was 1887. So if you go all the way back, so it's been going on a while. Um, it's being reviewed again at the moment. <coughs> there's a lot of discussions and how it does it link with the Port of Melbourne and doesn't link with the port of 
Brisbane, as we know, through the Cunningham Gap and down from Toowoomba, whichever way you go, it's incredibly expensive. <clears throat> There's a, a large amount of money to be spent and then to get to the port. Uh, and I, I don't remember the the numbers, but it's a dispro for the amount of kilometres, it's a disproportionate amount of spend relative to the kilometres to be travelled. And I think that's the bulk. Um, as someone from logistics and supply chain, I think we should have the inland rail. I think it should line up to go through our ports. It should be a better connector with longer uh, rail sidings and a different view on swept paths and a different view on pathing. Um, and I agree that the comments it should link up with the port. I just think it's a very, very difficult issue for state, federal and council because you have to have council approval on a lot of these changes to the pathways. Um, and I don't think it'll be resolved anytime soon. I don't think still 10, 15 years away, isn't it, for the inland rail? So I'll be well retired. <laughs> and, and to Hermione's point, the skills required to build and then, and then uh, you know, drive the trains, that's going to take a while as well. Well, it, it, it will. And I think the thing uh, that, that I'd add to this is that, you know, it's, if we're going to do something, let's do it properly. If we're going to do something, I think we as a country need to start biting the bullet on what we actually need to do. And what we need to do is look at landside logistics that gets us to the ports as quickly as possible. Um, we have been an import dominant nation. We've got massive agricultural exports and different exports that we need to get out. And what we can control is the landside logistics task to the ports, say for export. And uh, the last mile is not at the port. The last mile is over in another country where those exports need to go. Uh, and we need to make sure that our ports and every point of our chain can be as effective and efficient as possible so that then our exporters can compete on global markets. And we need to get really serious about this. And mm. I think this is a, a, good, a good example of how serious we need to get mm. in doing it properly and making sure they're joined up. You know, it's pretty basic to say joined up thinking. It sounds like a primary school, but we need joined up thinking in logistics. It's no good if it just stops a rail line, stops 30 kilometres outside and away from a port. Mm. What's supposed to happen? Mm. So, I agree. Interesting. Um, now, this is obviously a mainland point, but uh, when uh, one of uh, our participants today registered, they actually uh, fed a, a question in uh, to the panel, and it might be appropriate to ask because the question's from Tasmania, uh, you know, Inland rail only deals with the mainland. What about uh, uh, some of the logistics issues pertaining to Tasmanian business? Have you got any comments on that? Perhaps. Uh... Well, I think the, I think first of all, I think the federal government and and I'm not a I'm a long a contractor um, and uh, and help the federal government, so I'm not an employee. I think they did a fantastic job in the budget for Hobart Airport. The $60 million there <clears throat> after lots and lots of discussions to extend the runway, to redo the aprons, to reinforce uh, the turning circles there, etc. so that wide body, heavy A350s, heavy 777s, heavy 787s uh, could land and take off there full of fuel and full of freight and full of passengers and also for the Antarctic emissions, was just a fantastic thing to do. And I know that was a really tough decision <coughs> that the state and um, the feds, how do I know about that? When we were <coughs> in OFAM trying to land planes there for the cherry season and, and to help exporters out of Tasmania during COVID, the planes we hired couldn't go out full of freight. Or couldn't go out full of fuel. We had to do it uh, uh, re-landing in Sydney to refuel. So I congratulate the federal government on doing that. I think there's been a lot of money going to sea freight again. I know when I was running toll, and the state and federal governments helped us rebuild uh, Burnie and dredge it again and 
rebuild the wharfs there and then did the same at um, at uh, Melbourne. Now, that, that was a lot of money. That was for $340 million or something like that. And because that ship, those two ships move 8,000 tonnes a night each way. Um, so one plane takes 40 tonne when you're moving 8,000 tonne a night. So I, I think the... I think they've done some really good things, both the federal and the state government for Tasmania. I think that the main problems that haven't been resolved there are food grade containers, 20 grade and 20 foot containers. There's always a desperate shortage of good containers in Tasmania. And then the service out of Bell Bay uh, has been, and I know a few of us have tried to help there, we've been completely unsuccessful. Uh, and to have a, a really good international service we, we need to have consistency out of Bell Bay, and that hasn't happened with uh, MSC. I think that that's not MSC's fault either. I think it goes to the long-term viability of an alumina uh, smelter there and what you're going to do there with, with outcomes. But I, I do think the feds and the state have done some really good things, but there's always more to be done. Mm. You touched on food grade containers there. The uh, lead question at the moment on Slido, just reminding everybody, hashtag ESCS. But uh, do you have any, uh, uh, can you give us an overview on the reefer market for 2023, um, especially from a seasonal perspective? And further, what impact has the flooding had on export of grain flow forecasts? No idea on the second question. Um, so won't make anything up. The answer is don't know. Um, <laughs> So oh, I don't want to make things up. That's where you get into trouble. I obviously will. Uh, they were, I think Australians were going to have a record grain crop this year. And <clears throat> if you want to look at how dire some things are, look at uh, the West in regard to CBH and its major announcement last Friday. I think that they're going to have to spend $4 billion on infrastructure, on rail and uh, storage um, to get to your 24 or 25 million tonnes in the West, a CBH have to spend $450 million a year and the state government there are putting in a lot of money as well to get the additional of the grain harvest. And I think the farmers are very unhappy about that because that's been taken or that money was going to be their rebate, mm. which they could pull back into their farms. But <clears throat> I don't quite understand how it all works, but I read about that. In regard to the first question, <clears throat> There have been a lot of uh, interrogation of people about food grade containers. I know that particularly the Tasmanians have been all over us and the South Australians. And what we found really interesting, which I still don't understand completely, and we will try to understand the logic of what we've been told, but 50% of food grade... Con so if there's 100 grade food grade containers come into the country with food in them, some type of food, we can only use 50 outbound as food grade containers. Why is that? Because our standards of the definition of a food grade container is much higher than the import. Good point. Now, I don't understand that myself. We only, we've tried, and I know the South Australians and the Tasmanians have been asking us lots of questions about food grade container shortages, reefer shortages, et cetera, et cetera. Why aren't they being turned around? But when we've gone back and asked the shipping companies, asked associations, asked Border Force, asked everyone, about 50% of them get knocked out. Hmm. Now, I don't understand why. We will have to try to understand that much more thoroughly. So, yes, technically there's 100, but in reality there's 50. And I'm rounding for simplicity. <coughs> Understood. Interesting. Um, hmm. Might have to dig some further into that. The, um, the five of us will try to dig further. Into it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Question here on Slido again. This uh, from Santa. Um, Santa asks, one of the main issues is with Darwin is about not being able to get wide body aircraft in. You touched on Hobart for the... Similar issue there. Can you address the issue in your future discussions with airlines? Well, the good thing is, is that we have, which the Northern Territory Government and others have done a great job with uh, Cathay. They do have the Mango Express. We 
uh, that has just started, I think, or is just about to start, that uh, a lot of the Northern Territorians have not been able to get their produce into uh, North Asia unless they trucked it to particularly Melbourne and Sydney because there just wasn't enough, no direct flights out of uh, Adelaide and then Brisbane has had shortages. So a group of people have Cathay flying in there, moving full loads out of um, out of Darwin directly through Cathay, particularly into South Korea. There has been an announcement about that to, to get the mango crop out this year, um, which I hear is pretty heavy. They've had a good season. Uh, so I thank everyone who's been involved in that. One of the problems when we had IFAM there uh, was that there is four heavy aircraft and there's not many heavy, heavy, wide bodies go through Darwin. DHL were doing it for a while, I believe. Um, that there was no uh, loader mm. for the planes. So if you recall, the Air Vice Marshal, Marg Stabe, organised the Air Force to do it, but that was only a temporary measure. So the equipment, the ground equipment for heavy wide body through um, the ground providers like Donata and others wasn't at that airport. Same in Hobart where Cathay and the federal government moved the equipment out of Melbourne Airport to uh, Hobart to load those cherry pines. So that, since those airports haven't been set up for heavy, heavy, fully loaded wide bodies, they didn't actually have the ground handling equipment, which is probably something that has to be done there. Mm -hmm. But that should be a commercial issue for Donata or Swissport or someone like that. Mm, interesting. Um, I'm going to have a pump myself at the an answer to the next question from Niranjan. Um, what's the take towards the move towards e um, electric vehicles? Sustainable energy means uh, savings in costs uh, for the supply chain. My comment on that would be you've got to get the vehicles into the country first. You've got to be able to, you have to have the infrastructure to fuel them. You also need drivers. So, uh, um, you know, there, there are a number of problems there before we start to see the savings through vis-a-vis, um, -vis, um, you know, uh, regular um, combustion fuels. So um... there's some really interesting information. If you get on the website of Daimler, <coughs> Daimler, mm. uh, the, we're Volkswagen, actually the largest truck manufacturer in the world, but Daimler are the heavy specialists. They own Western Star, Freightliner, Mercedes-Benz, Fuso. So you have all those brands in Australia. They're the largest in North America, or Volvo, who own Volvo, Renault, and Mac. If you look at those, they have charts about electrification, mm -hmm. and they have big pieces of work that they're done on when uh, they're going to go to a full electrification. It is a long way away. Mm -hmm. And there's an article just been published, I think, for Europe, that even by 2035, 74% or something like that of all vehicles, heavy, heavy vehicles, as in uh, prime movers at the heavy end, uh, will still be on fossil fuel. Mm. Interesting, and we still got to get them there after they've been built, but do <laughs> mind if you uh, well, have thoughts on that too? Yeah, I do. And one of the things is I think that it's extraordinary that in Europe, Daimler and Volvo formed a partnership about five years ago, four years ago, um, so that they could, as major competitors, so that they could work towards uh, hydrogen um, mm. and bringing that into freight vehicles. I think one of while you are, what you have said, Dave, is absolutely true about how do you get the vehicles here if we don't manufacture um, is a really big issue. But the companies, um, the companies, uh, so many companies, the RC, are investing in all manner of uh, innovation in this way and um, implementation. So it's a really high priority, even though it is problematic. Interesting. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. Another pre-recorded uh, question with uh, a point of registration, um, and, and we need a crystal ball here. Maybe this is one for, for you, Michael. Um, what's the overview of the next 12 months regarding availability of capacity for flights and sailings options to Europe and South America? 
No, no, nothing, no, nothing about South America. So I, I can't help you there. It's not a, a major trading lane. How we look at uh, seeing air freight. So that is not a piece of work. If a, if a state government asked us to do that, or one of the big associations, we could have a look at that. But that doesn't fall in our. I don't think there'll be much change at all now. Until the northern hemisphere summer flying season, which starts in April. So I think we're on a trajectory of where we are. I think people will really struggle at Chinese New Year because the only planes we see coming of any number are for the ski season in Japan, Canada and North America. They are will be pretty full, so there'll be no extra planes or capacity. Uh, the airlines are saying to us they're not bringing back old gas guzzlers and they are not. Uh, they don't have tech crew to fly a, a heavier utilisation schedule. Um, so I don't think aircraft will change much. You know, I don't think prices are coming down. In fact, uh, the thing that's concerning me the most is what will happen with Northern Hemisphere energy inventories feedstock and whether after reductions of OPEC and if we have a very tough winter, whether fuel pricing will go up. Mm -hmm. For shipping, it's much more unpredictable. I didn't expect, or we didn't expect, the pricing to come down so hard on the Shanghai index and to Europe. What has surprised us, it hasn't come down at the relatively same angle as exports. For Australia, they've been higher, but they did start at a lower commodity base. We are concerned about fuel and bunkered fuel. Look at that bunkered fuel number, $811 per metric tonne compared to three fifty one. Yeah. Well that's gonna pass through. They they're big numbers when you when you've got a six thousand TU ship, there's a lot of tons of fuel to push that thing through the water. So I think that could go up. Um, but it is good it's come down so heavily. I think we spoke to the Western Australians today that they saw their shipping rates at about three to four times pre COVID from DPIRD. They're not expecting it to come down anymore. It's probably about the same or a little bit less on the East Coast. Um, but that has been much more unpredictable. I think air freight has been fairly, and planes have been fairly predictable. Um, <coughs> but fuel, and then slower start, slower sailing periods starting from the 1st of January to control emissions as per their global compact, which we think will reduce sailing times by between 10 and 20% in that older fleet. Very good. We're, we're right down to the wire. I've got one quick question here. You, you, I just need your short version yep. of an answer to this one. Can you share any insights from the Strategic Maritime Fleet Task Force? And what are the implications for Australian exporters? Can a national fleet be competitive in current market conditions? So one of my very good friends is John Mullen, and I wish him well. Who was who on the? Who <laughs> He's the, the chair, chair. The <laughs> and I wish him well. Excellent answer. <laughs> Thank you, Hermione. You can't better that than is, answer either. That's a dangerous place. Um, uh, there is one oh, uh, one last question here about the port of Newcastle is now able to uh, take export containers without penalty. Do you see that as having any immediate benefit for exporters or importers? Sorry, I missed that. Newcastle, viability. No, it would be uh, it would be a conflict of interest me being on New South Wales ports for me to comment. So I have to recluse myself from that discussion. But I could make a comment about it because I'll talk about I don't have that um, conflict. That conflict, mm -hmm. um, but I would say that uh, when you look at the freight movements around Sydney, this massive metropolitan area towards the, in the west, mm -hmm. um, the south, the west, um, as opposed to where Newcastle is, uh, which is to the north, and mm -hmm. is there's a, a, an issue there about geography there's, in there's terms of where the volumes and there's a disconnect. Terrific. Yeah. We're, we're, we're down in the last minute, and I just want to pay tribute to uh, the whole team. It's a very small team uh, that works to bring all these insights to make to make all of this happen. Uh, in particular, we I want to... Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Bianca Wheeler, who's been a prime mover for us and for any of you who've been involved in the briefings uh, through uh, the last uh, almost three years since the beginning of the International Freight Adjustment Mechanism. 
of assistant mechanism and also through the birth and, and what we're doing with export supply chain services. Uh, Bianca has been a, 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 a powerful force for good uh, in leading the team. Uh, we're sad to see her go, but we're very pleased that she'll be remaining with, uh, with industry uh, and working very closely with us, but from the other side, uh, Bianca, you're a great friend and a terrific and hard worker, and we value your insights and we look forward to working to, with you in the future. Thank you all for attending today. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, supplychains at austrade.gov.au, and uh, we wish you all uh, the very best and look forward to talking with you next. <coughs> Bye for now.